Our next focus is going to be on the central nervous system, which includes the brain and spinal cord. This chart goes over the divisions of the nervous system, which we'll come back to. At this point, we are on the left side of the diagram, which is focusing on the central nervous system, the brain, and the spinal cord. The central nervous system has many different protective measures. One is bone. The skull protects the brain and the vertebral column protects the spinal cord. Meninges are a tough tissue wrapping around the brain and the spinal cord. And cerebral spinal fluid is a fluid that is around the brain and spinal cord that is kept in place because it is between the brain and the meninges. The brain has many different parts. The cerebrum is the largest part of the brain. Its functions are voluntary conscious activities of the body, intelligence, learning, and judgment. The cerebrum is the wrinkly part of the brain and the wrinkles are called convolutions. The wrinkles or convolutions increase the surface area of the brain. And by increasing the surface area with all these wrinkles, it allows more neurons to have connections with each other. And that increases the capacity for learning and development. Remember, neurons are amitotic. They don't divide. So you don't learn by getting more neurons. You learn by more neurons making connections with other neurons. So the more surface area, the more areas for connections there are, as opposed to if you had a smooth brain. There would not be as many connections that could be formed. The cerebrum is made of two hemispheres. The hemispheres are the halves of the cerebrum. They're separated by the longitudinal fissure. So there's a physical separation or a space between the hemispheres, but they are connected deep within the brain by the corpus callosum. And that allows the two hemispheres of the brain to communicate with one another. Each hemisphere is responsible for different tasks. The right hemisphere controls the left side of the body and it's more creative and artistic, where the left hemisphere of the brain controls the right side of the body and it's more analytical and mathematical. Now, even though each hemisphere of the brain specializes in certain tasks, that does not mean you only use the right or the left side of the brain. Even though, for example, the left side is more analytical and mathematical, even if that is what you're really strong with, you're still using the right side of the brain even when you are doing those analytical and mathematical tasks. You just might favor the left hemisphere a little bit more. Each hemisphere is further subdivided into four lobes and each lobe controls very specific processing that occurs in the brain. The occipital lobe is where vision is processed. The parietal lobe is where touch, pressure, pain, taste, and spatial relationships are processed. The temporal lobe is where hearing, smell, memory, and understanding language is processed. And the frontal lobe is where reasoning, voluntary movement, planning, emotions, and problem solving is processed.
gray matter versus white matter. Gray matter is the darker outer layer of the cerebrum that's made primarily of dendrites and cell bodies. Gray matter is also referred to as the cerebral cortex. White matter is the lighter inner layer of the cerebrum that's made primarily of axons. The white matter acts like wires that connect the surface to the rest of the brain. This is just showing the breakdown of gray matter versus white matter. Another part of the brain is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is at the back base of the skull. It coordinates voluntary movements and it also functions in balance and posture. Another part is the brainstem. The brainstem connects the brain and spinal cord and it controls involuntary vital functions such as blood pressure, heart rate, breathing, and swallowing. The brainstem is composed of three parts, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Inside the brain, there is a structure called the thalamus, which receives sensory information and sends it to the correct lobe of the cerebrum for processing. It's kind of like the traffic cop of the brain where sensory information first stops at the thalamus and the thalamus will determine which lobe it needs to send that information to. Under the thalamus is the structure called the hypothalamus. Hypo means beneath. And so that's why we find it underneath the thalamus. It functions in regulation of releasing hormones, body temperature, sleep and wake cycles, hunger and thirst, emotional responses, and stress. Sometimes people confuse the functions of the hypothalamus and the brainstem. The brainstem is controlling whether or not those functions are actually occurring. The hypothalamus is regulating them, determining for example, how fast or slow those different functions are occurring. The other major part of the central nervous system is the spinal cord. The spinal cord is the communication link between the brain and the body. It relays information back and forth through spinal nerves. Different nerves are responsible for different parts of the body, as you can see on this slide. Injuries to the spinal cord can interrupt communication between the brain and the body, and that can lead to different forms of paralysis. Another thing that the spinal cord controls are reflexes. Reflexes are involuntary, instantaneous responses to a stimulus. It allows the fast response to a potential danger. It allows action before the impulse actually reaches the brain. And it follows a pathway called the reflex arc. Here are some examples of reflexes. A sneeze is a reflex in response to an irritant in the upper respiratory system. A cough is a reflex in response to an irritant in the lower respiratory system. The blink reflex responds to irritation of the cornea. And the patellar reflex responds to the stretching of the patellar tendon. The reflex arc is a fast pathway and impulse travels. It is from a sense organ to the spinal cord and back. And so it bypasses the brain. Because it doesn't go to the brain, it is a very fast response. 
The reflex arc includes a stimulus, a sensory neuron, a spinal cord interneuron, a motor neuron, and an effector or the part of the body that responds. So here's an example. Your skin would be the receptor. It's going to send a message through a sensory neuron to the integration center or the spinal cord, where an interneuron is then going to relay a response through a motor neuron to the effector or a muscle causing you to have a response. Here's an example of a reflex arc. Reflexes allow fast protective responses because it's only sending a message to the spinal cord and back. A pain sensation will come later. And that's because a pain sensation is separate from a reflex. The pain sensation must travel all the way to the brain and back. This is why you react when it comes to a reflex before you even realize that it hurts. So the reflex arc versus pain sensation. The reflex arc allows fast response to a potentially harmful stimulus. This is because the message only needs to travel to the spinal cord and back. The pain message must travel a further distance, all the way to the brain and back. The pain sensation comes after the reflex response has already occurred. This is why you often respond to something painful, but actually feel the pain sensation after you have already reacted. <laughs> 